Hi there, this is Dominic Keating. I played Malcolm Reed, particularly on Star Trek Enterprise. And you're listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents... Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to another marvellous edition of Neil Before Pod, the podcast that has neither an army nor a halt. An event a decade in the making is nearly upon us now that Avengers Infinity War is right around the corner. So it's time to go back to quite a while after it all started and talk about the first Avengers film as well as the entire universe. So for this, I sent out a call and a brave squad of heroes answered. For the purpose of this, we have all chosen our own Marvel characters and first up is our very own God of Hammers, fresh from the Bifrost, it's Cat. Hello. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Very excited to be here. Good, good. That's what we like to hear. Next up is our master of the techie arts, the man who keeps this podcast from imploding. It's Chris. Hello. He also manages to make invites to screenings up here from thin air. So, you know, maybe magic. It could be. <laughs> or or Are blackmail. You our <laughs> <laughs> good guess, good guess. Uh, Lastly, we have a man driven by his own boundless obsession with the dark dimension known as the internet, as well as the need to have freaky eyes. It's Isaac! Hey! Hello. Can anyone guess who he's supposed to be? Vision? No. No? Ooh. (laughs) Freaky eyes. Uh, Freaky eyes. Freaky eyes and the internet. Well, dark dimension. Oh. I'll just give it away. We'll be here all night. Kaecilius. Ah. Yay. It's a very strange... Oh, Mickelson. yes, the bad guy in... in the bad in guy strange. in Doctor Strange. Yes, okay. I've only seen that movie once. Um, He's nice and forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> As are a lot of Marvel villains. <laughs> well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Yes. <laughs> And you might be wondering who I chose. So I'm the boss, head honcho, El Numero Uno, the Godfather, Lord of the Rings. I forgot what I was talking about a while ago. No, of course, of course it's Captain America. Who else would I be? Because Captain America really needs a Scottish accent. That's the one thing that's missing. Everything is improved with a Scottish accent, I think. Yep. Well, I mean, we've got an English Superman, so why can't we have a Scottish Captain America? Right. <laughs> a British Spider-Man. True, true. So maybe it's time for the Scottish Captain America. <laughs> I think so. I think I think we've reached that point. Plus, Chris <laughs> Evans is uh, is giving up the job soon, so I think I'll I'll put in my application. Well, you've already got the beard going for you. <laughs> Sometimes, only, only when I'm not shaved for a few days. So we're here to talk about you know a very small set of indie films that make up a shared universe called. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't think that many people have heard about it, but hopefully we'll get it some recognition by this podcast. <laughs> you know, we'll get the word out there and people will have heard of it after this. Um, I mean, I personally stumbled across it just randomly, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you all came by it. Was it was it the same? Just, you know, posters at film festivals and, and all that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've killed this joke already. A little it's, bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It was a very art house uh, movement, I, you know. I, I kind of it was very small scale, and a friend of mine was into the books and said, "I really, I really should get into the films, but it's not as good as the books." But you know, he said you might like it, and you know, it turned out he was right. Do you know what the argument could be made? <laughs> <laughs> If we really get deeply into it and whether the comic books are better than than the films, that's oof, it's a different story. Um, but anyway, <laughs> if you wanted civil war, cattle give you civil war. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> Team Thor for the win. Team Thor. He wasn't even a side. He wasn't even there. But it's, nah, Team Thor. That's why. <laughs> yeah. He was too busy off having fun on his own planet. <laughs> Yeah, so 
I thought it might be a good idea to start talking about the Avengers because I see that as the kind of centrepiece of this whole thing. It was the first thing they built towards and then it, it did enable them to do all sorts of other weird stuff afterwards. It's just one of those things where now anything's possible and they've proven that by making pretty much anything possible afterwards and they continue to do so. Or may, well, they might continue to do so. We don't know what the, the future plans are other than a few films. So... Um, We'll just get straight into spoiler-free chat about this, uh, even though it's a few years old now. Uh, I think it's eight years old, if you believe Spider-Man. But, <laughs> I don't know, I, I think it's about six years old, based on when it came out. Um, so, Kat, we'll start with you. What did you think of the film, without spoiling it, for people that might not have seen it? Sure. Uh, if you haven't seen the first Avengers film... Um I think it does a great job of bringing all the Avengers together in a way that is believable for them to have met. You know, the circumstances, I think, are uh, pretty good. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was really uh, (laughs) heavily into the MCU at the time. Uh, So 2012, April, so around this time, actually, um, (laughs) I... I think I saw it seven times at cinema, uh, twice on the first day. <laughs> uh, so, you know, to, to give you an idea, I was just, yeah, like so hyped up for it uh, in the lead up. I was like uh, watching the trailers like all the time, just like speculating. Um, I just couldn't, couldn't wait. And it delivered like truly it was the, the kind of film I wanted it to be. And I think it set the bar very high for, you know, the, the rest of the MCU. I mean, truly, that was the challenge. You know, mm-hmm. can we make a movie with everybody in it and have it make sense and have it be fun and have it be, like, a sustainable format? And as you say, they've cracked it. They've, they've done it. Um, and they keep doing it, you know, six years later. And that's really cool. Um, so, yeah, like, it was definitely like peak like it absolutely was like the culmination of phase one um a really fun really great kind of blockbuster film and yeah i i have a lot of emotions (laughs) lots of emotions Uh, isaac you can go next yeah because i didn't like the avengers (laughs) (laughs) because i watched when did the first iron man come out was that 2009 2008 2008. Yeah, that's in that one. I've not seen any of the other ones. And I thought I'll get back into this with the big, the main one. And I came out and I, and I never watched. I think I eventually watched Doctor Strange, whatever that one. So I think I missed out on about. So I missed out on like three years. And then I went to watch <laughs> Avengers, and I, I went, no, 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 I'm not, not for me, not interested. I remember it just being, just loads of sort of infighting for the first bit, and then there was something else, and there was. I could get lost. I was like, oh, some more people are showing up. Because I can't remember, like, I know it's a spoiler free bit, but I can't really remember what's. Because it's like a, it, was, it was ages ago film. It's hard to sort of remember which bits are spoilers or which bits weren't. So I was like, yeah, these people are in and they'll fight in, and Loki's here. And, and I sort of left it. I was like, well, that was a. Well, now you've just spoiled time. that people fight in a superhero film. I mean, people how fight in it. <laughs> <laughs> and and how could you? Yeah. So yeah, I'm okay with sort of left the cinema. And I was like, oh, everyone else is happy, but <laughs> never mind. What else was that? I can't remember what else was that like. Yeah, I can't remember what sort of films I was. It was comparable comparable to. What else was, was it? Twenty twelve. Spider Man. <laughs> that was the same year, wasn't it? Twenty twelve, yeah. really? Yeah, I think so. Oh damn! Yeah, the Dark Knight Rises. That was the same year. Just doing a quick Google, actually. Yeah, Dark Knight Rises, Skyfall, that was the biggest one. Uh, but that was later that year. Uh, yeah, and you're right, Amazing Spider-Man. Oh, wow. Uh, Looper character. as well. Oh, and the first Hunger Games, of course. Cabin in the Woods as well. I remember thinking... Oh, that was saying, good. That was like, good. Uh, this is a Joss Whedon film, but not the Joss Whedon film I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> It was like a month before as well, so I was, just, mm. I was in, right in the mood for some Joss Whedon. Uh, so, Chris, what do you think of Avengers without the spoilers? Well, I've got to be honest that when I 
I first heard about it, I was like, oh, this is what they've been building up to. It's like it hadn't quite clicked on me at the time. I think I'd watched the 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 sort of the Incredible Hulk, but I hadn't stayed for the sort of post creditsy thing. So I didn't know what that was about. And then Iron Man, I'd obviously seen little tie-ins to S.H.I.E.L.D. and that. And then four and everything, they start building up and building up and building up all these elements. So, yeah, I, I, when it finally came round, I was just really, really excited for it. And I think seeing the the sort of unification of all these characters that you've become a bit invested in well, really sort of uh, lit, the, lit the fuse, really, on my, uh, my fanboyism of this, I think, is the uh, best way to go around it. Uh, we're all going to be picking on Isaac because he doesn't like it. Yeah, sorry, Isaac. <laughs> sorry in advance. Uh, I'm also in the I love it camp. Um, I loved it from the the moment, the first moment I saw it. It was there were several moments throughout the film where I had a big dumb grin on my face. Um, I remember seeing it opening day, loving it, being super hyped for it. The whole MCU experiment was something I was really interested in because, as a reader of the comics, it was quite common to be. You know, you read an Iron Man comic and then Spider-Man turns up for a panel or two and it's just a thing. It's, you know, it's no big deal. Although it is kind of a big deal because it's like, oh, look, it's Spider-Man. I like Spider-Man. You know, so th- what they essentially did was turn that into live action. Although at the time, didn't think about how, just how big it was going to get. And the fact that you had six characters coming together in one film was remarkable in itself. And, and the fact that you got to know them in their own films. Although I think this film also works in its own merits as well. So it's, you know, you could just watch it as a film because it tells you everything you need to know about the characters as long as you're willing to accept it. But I absolutely, yeah, absolutely loved it and I continue to love it. And every time there's a new Marvel movie coming out, I'm dead excited. It doesn't matter what one it is. So yeah, big fan. So uh, we should just get into spoilers because I can't think of anything else without spoiling it. And Isaac's already spoiled that they fight. So, you know, yeah. shocking. It's a big twist. <laughs> big twist. Shocking. <laughs> People fight a superhero film. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay. Uh, everybody ready for spoilers? Yeah. 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 Cool. Avengers Assemble! Okay, we're safe. We can talk about whatever we want. We're on board the helicarrier. We can talk freely. No one's listening in that we know of. Uh, apart from all the listeners, I hope. I hope they're all listening <laughs> in. Uh, it's not that classified. So, I touched on this in my kind of blurb, but bringing characters together after solo films to see how they kind of come together and interact. It's something that hadn't really been done before, at least not to this scale. I mean, the the closest analogue is sort of the universal monsters where everyone just comes together, you know, where they, they have Dracula and the Wolfman and all that stuff uh, way, way back. But this is kind of... It's a long project where they spent the time building it up. And what do you think of that as a as an idea? You know, when it was building up, Chris, you said that you didn't realise what was going on <laughs> until you saw the Avengers. But, yeah, uh, I yeah. didn't quite realise until it was too late. <laughs> it was, it was like, oh, that's yeah. what they're doing. Oh, that's such a smart idea. It's like they do in the comics <laughs> where they all kind of team up because they're all in the same place. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, do you know what? I think it's something that other people have tried to replicate later on and haven't quite got right. But these characters, at the end of the day exist in a universe where they are built to work together. So I think setting out with that goal in mind and still making the standalone films interesting to watch, some more successful than others, to be fair, um, is a is a tough job. And I think they, they managed to pull it off. I mean, when you finally get that shot or those shots of the whole team standing and fighting together, it's a great payoff to, you know, several films worth of work. What, four or five films worth before then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, two of which were Iron Man films, but yeah, yeah, because uh, he was the popular one, despite being one of the most obscure at the time. But but this uh, but this is the thing they managed to take what is like one of the most you know the most popular character in there, still give them a, a good enough uh, role in the film, and tie in the others that you've got to know and give them enough of a standing. It's pretty well balanced considering uh, what they could have done to it. It's interesting to look back now and think that they essentially made this franchise out of all the characters that were really cheap to get hold of at the time by Marvel Studios because they were a very young, um, 
not that profitable studio to begin with. So they had the rights for various characters and they brought them together. But it's when you think about what they've got now and what they've achieved since then, it's unimaginable. So they went mm. with a bunch of second, third tier superhero characters and, and turned them into some of the most recognisable, iconic characters in cinema. It's crazy. And with that, of course, the careers of everyone involved and the yes. money that's come from, you know, merchandising and all of that, it's it's truly ingenious. They've 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 really cracked the formula. Yeah, what invented the formula really. Yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah. And um for some reason others can't seem to just copy what they've done and make it <laughs> successful. Because everyone else tries to rush it. That's exactly. Well, yeah. and by everyone else, we mean the studio that will not be named. <laughs> I, w- I was talking about the dark universe. So I don't know what you were on about. But... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, truly. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. That one. You know, um... that cinematic universe that's had one film and they've already <laughs> sacked it. So... And that's it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm take- I take it you think it was a successful experiment as well, Kat. You said you were heavily into it. I mean, what was your kind of build up like as you were watching the, the films as they appeared? <laughs> I mean, um, I came into it a little bit late, uh, and I think this is something that we're going to be touching on a little bit later with our own introductions to the to the universe. Um, but I I wasn't really watching along. I kind of came into it kind of halfway into phase three, uh, phase one. Is it what? Phase, phase one. Phase one is what I meant. Started, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, halfway into phase one, I was like made aware of this thing. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I went back and I watched the films. So then it was like, all right, you know, now I'm ready. And by the time that the film came out, you know, I I was really invested in a lot of the characters. I knew who they were. I, I you know, had ideas about where the story might, you know, go and, you know, who the villain might be, etc. cetera. Um, so... Yeah, like whenever the trailer started dropping and, you know, everything kind of started coming together, I was so, so, so into it. Um, and perhaps, you know, that uh, sort of comparing to what Isaac said before about, you know, not really being familiar with all these people and then coming into this film kind of, hello, here we are. Um, you don't know who we are, but, you know, let us entertain you sort of. And you know i knew who they were and i think for for most of us you know knowing who they are and their stories and what they're each bringing to the table i think that this movie really did it well like bringing in people like black widow and the hulk and like hawkeye who we'd only seen in that one scene in thor um, you know, well, suddenly becoming. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think that he does something. I think he's valuable, even in that one scene, um, <laughs> because he brings he he brings empathy. Um, he's he's a very human character, Clint. You know, he doesn't really have superpowers. He just has really good aim. That's it. Um, and so, you know, comparing comparing him to everyone else, you know, he is truly like the one guy who's like I'm just I'm just here to help and like he he has a lot of empathy you know he sees Thor like try to find his way out of that compound in the first Thor film and he goes oh I like him I'm not going to shoot him you know like he he can tell so much about a person from just that and then when we see him in the Avengers film he is that guy you know who who can just like tell a lot about people and he's really you know he sticks to his opinion and he defends others. And I, I think even in, um, oh, which one was it? Civil War that I rewatched recently. Um, again, you know, he's the guy who defends the, the, the person who might not have had a voice. Like, you know, he stands by Wanda. He says, okay, you know, like, I'm going to get you out. Just, I don't know. I like him. I like Hawkeye. People give him a lot of crap, but I like him. Yeah, I like Hawkeye. I just think his cameo in Thor is a bit. Well, here's Haw- here's this guy with a bow and arrow. And... Yeah, I was like, I mean, yeah, like watching the first Thor film and not knowing who this guy is from the comics, I was like, who who is this guy? <laughs> is he significant? And like, I had to why Google is he him. Picking up a gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, like, why? What's what's happening? Like, it's, it's they treat him like he's important, but we we don't know who, what his name is. We don't know, you know. 
what the hell? Like, who are you? Um, and then eventually, you know, like I Googled it and it was like, oh, I see. And perhaps that could have been handled a little bit better, his introduction. I always, but I always anyway. thought he should have been in the rest of the film because he just mm-hmm. disappears after that. But Yeah, that's true. Yeah, But I don't like the first horror film. Right? <gasps> <laughs> no, my heart. <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, no. we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Um, Isaac, you've already touched on that you weren't you weren't a fan, but uh, what do you yeah. think of the idea of bringing them all together after a bunch of solo films and 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 making it work in one big film? Uh, well, I don't know because I didn't well, I didn't like I didn't really know any of the characters. Like it wasn't a, like I was too much of a filthy casual to know what like, <laughs> anyone. So it's hard to say, like, I can't really say oh, I worked together as a film, because it's like, at the end of the film, I was like, I still don't know who any of these people are. They're just Scully Johansson, and then, yeah, some dude with a bow, and <laughs> some guard guy, and Hulk, and then Iron Man, and I can do Iron Man and Captain America just sort of from, like, you know, they're, 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 they're by that point, they were, like, big, busy, like, cool enough to, so everyone knew them. So I think, like, and even after having now, like, you know, know the comics, know the characters and stuff, I we went back and saw it, well, Again, like whenever I moved here, it's like I still don't, still don't like it. Even after, even now, I know what is going on and know like the Chitori and you know the, the Infinity Stones and everything. I'm like, I still, I still don't think it works. It's still just a load of sort of people just sort of having an ego competition for like the first hour, and then just nonsense for the next hour. <laughs> that more or less so, sums it up. To be fair, more yeah. or less. Well, in, in a kind of very broad nutshell but um you did to be to be fair you did kind of pick the wrong film to pick it back up on yeah (laughs) Yeah, definitely not a film it's not a go into the the universe film it's like it's like watching the finale of a tv series first yes see it is it is something that is impossible for us to view it from that point of if you've not seen the other films what you know, what do you take away from it? And you're very clear that it kind of spoils some of the enjoyment for you because you're not already invested in the characters and you don't already know their sort of personas before they arrive. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, so I remember watching, like, the in- the opening scene and, like, oh, this, we've got the we've got the blue cube and, and Loki turns up and he's like, oh, no, he's got the, he's got the, he's got the blue cube. And I'm like, I'm, I'm already, it's only been, like, a minute and I'm already so far away <laughs> from this film. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, there's... So I know the, 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 the agent with sunglasses and he's got a bow. And now, they've got, now there's a car chase. And by that point, I was like, oh, this is definitely not... By that point, I was like, I'm already out immediately. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't... It's not a film that you couldn't start if you were introducing someone to the Marvel unit like films. Yeah, not see, yet. we... We all watched that opening scene and went, oh my God, Dr. Selvig's back. Oh, yeah, I like exactly. that guy. Yeah. I was just like, "Hi, Coulson. It's good to see you." Again. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, "I don't yeah. know who Maria Hill is." So uh, yeah, maybe I knew why who the character was, but like, yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah, the Marvel didn't rush into their movie, but like their big team up movie. But I rushed into their big team up movie. <laughs> so it's like the it's the opposite effects. All these like like Tom Cruise's The Mummy and stuff. Like I had the same. I had their method of team up movies going into it. It's like, oh, I'll work it out. They're all basically superheroes, and he's got a hammer, and he's got a shield. They're all like, but you go and you're like, no, nah, I can't. You can't jump in. It's not. There's too much. There's too much lore and past stuff going on. See, it's it's interesting that you say that because after like half a dozen viewings or something, I decided I would try and think about it as if I'd never seen a Marvel film before and didn't know who these characters were, and all right, maybe it doesn't tell you exactly who the characters are and why they're significant, but I think it does a good enough job of telling you who they are in this film, what their purpose is in this film. And obviously there's a certain amount of suspension of disbelief. You have to believe in the fact that some guy can fly about in a rocket-powered suit of armour and you know some guy can turn into a giant green creature and so on. You know, You have to kind of accept the the conceit of it and I realise it's impossible for me to say well, if I'd never seen this before I'd be able to follow it but you know, I feel like it spends a lot of time introducing the characters in a way that works in terms of their role in the the particular dynamic so, you know, when when you first meet Iron Man you learn that he's a tech genius and you know, all that stuff I think think every character's introduction gives you a flavour of what to expect from them Um, and 
I think it does it pretty well, you know. And the funniest thing is when uh, with Mark Ruffalo, they obviously they recast him from Edward Norton in The Incredible Hulk, and you've got this kind of every scene that he's in almost he reminds you who he is because he's the only one you might not <laughs> recognize. So he's just like, yeah, remember me? I'm Bruce Banner. I turn into the Hulk, and every scene it's like that, you know. It's um, I think Joss Whedon does an excellent job with the screenplay, just making it. Um, punching it up to make it kind of uh, accessible or as accessible as possible because the key the key to the success of this film was is it watchable or is it just going to be one big ref- self-referential thing for two hours I think there is a problem like I think sto- like story is the biggest problem though because like you said that Josh Whedon wrote like a good screenplay and stuff but like Loki's just there and then the tutorial because they gotta they got to fight someone and like there's no like well there's character yeah we get who Iron Man is we get Captain America is like we don't know like it's it's all very just sort of oh they have to be oh Loki's here there's a cube here the, there's aliens come in we better get these guys together and, and they go to Berlin and these other bits but it's all like just sort of it's just stuff happening in a row like it not, it's, it's not it's like plot a, driven and not character driven yeah That's it's just true. sort of like yeah. Here is this, now we have to go here. Then eventually, the we got to open the sky thing, and all the aliens are come in. But like, we don't know why they. We don't even know who they are. They're just some. It's just a thing. It's just the thing you have to punch in the film. Yeah, uh, it's Loki. full of MacGuffins and and yeah. plot devices. True. And but to be fair, the pen, the pending well. army isn't really set up before though. That's the thing. I mean, even if you've watched the other films, you don't know that there's an army waiting to come through to Earth. Yeah, but it's just like it's just a generic standard villain isn't it it's just like it's just a wall a wall of a wall of punchable expendable things and even loki is supposed to be like the god of tricks and lies and things he just sort of he's not very good at his job really he gets like like i've no idea like he's sort of he's never like is he fooling anybody is he here for any like what does he want what's his he's not manipulating anything he's just sort of he's kind of just like seeing what happens like by the seat of his pants he's like I'll just try this and see how this pans out and it, it, like he doesn't really get into anyone's head or anything so he's kind of not used I don't think he's used very well there because he's just the he's just Loki isn't it because he's the the Marvel villain that people remember from the because they can't use like Red Skull or they can't use Man with Beard from Iron Man <laughs> so they got to use Loki. It's the other one. Like he's the one people are like. Oh, I know who this villain is, and it was too early to use like, you know, Thanos or anything. So I think he was just in the film because he did well. Like people liked him from the earlier ones, but not for actually because, like, if it was any other villain, like if you took Loki out of that film and just put like any of the other Marvel villains, it's basically the same. Mm, uh, I disagree. Teleport. I think I think they had no choice at the time but to use Loki because he was the only one with a beef with anybody and with enough power to perhaps enact that beef. Like the fact that he wanted to rule so badly that he did what he did in the first Thor film that, you know, he <laughs> faked his own death, went off to find people to fight for him um, and then went huh, what's that place that, like, my dad saved that one time? I'm going to go back and, like, destroy it because I hate everybody. Um, And, you know, he's the only one from the lineup of the first uh, phase that with the capacity to do that. Perhaps because, you know, every other film has gotten rid of their villains in turn. You know, whoever was the bad guy in the first Iron Man, we never see him again. Um, uh, he dies. Exactly. The guy in Iron Man 2 dies as well. Incredible Hulk doesn't really have a villain, does it? It's just about Bruce being sad. Um, no, it does. It does the abomination. Oh, yeah, that's Turn right. Off. See, I don't even remember that film. It's just so. See, anyway. I love the Incredible Hulk, and it's the forgotten stepchild. Of <laughs> it really is. It yeah. really is the forgotten <laughs> stepchild. Um, and yeah, and as Isaac said, like the Red Skull from Captain America gone and dusted so we can't we can't use him either um but i think he does bring something to the table that no other villain could and 
I like that they didn't invent a new villain. I like that they brought someone with a past that the audience could go, oh, yeah, like, I remember that this guy, you know, has issues and is a bit of a psycho. Um, you know, what's he going to do now sort of thing. Uh, he is unpredictable. I do agree that he they don't really use his powers enough in a way that is, you know, sort of fair to the character as well. Uh, he does possess Clint and Selvig at one point, but that's a bit, like, as... It's just, yeah, like, it's plot-driven. It's not necessarily character-driven. I and live possession for... Possession has nothing to do with him either. It's, yeah, it's like, true. I that's live true. for the moments... I live for the moments in the first Avengers film that are all about, you know, finding out where Loki was in the interim, what has happened to him. It's It's alluded to that he might have been tortured or somebody, you know, might have hurt him, perhaps Thanos or someone, you know, under his wing. Um, and and that's what I'm more interested in and that we never really find out anything about. Like, even so far, we haven't found out anything about what, what exactly happened in that kind of blank space in between the first Thor film and Avengers. But, yeah, I do agree that, you know, it... It is plot driven, and perhaps that's a bit of a weakness. It does feel, perhaps at this point, because it's 2018 and we've all seen a lot of superhero films, um, and the MacGuffins and like the the kind of uh, common tropes of superhero films specifically now have become like painfully obvious. And especially looking back at the first Avengers film, like it's easy to kind of go back and recognize flaws like this. The fact that it's not necessarily driven by, you know, characters making decisions. It's more like people are reacting to something that's happening. Oh, we have to go get this item that will help us do this thing. So let's go to Germany for some reason. Um, you know, it's just full of moments like this. And I do agree that that's not very compelling, or at least as compelling as it could be if it was more, you know, character-driven, about people's choices, about what people want, and then sort of, you know, the people who um, stand in their way. And, yeah, that would have been nicer. And I do agree as well about the punchable, the punchable army thing, uh, the gray, faceless kind of, you know, they all look the same, they are expendable because they're not human. Um, and that is a recurring motif within the MCU as well. And something that is a weakness overall within the genre. But anyway, I do like it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is just so much fun. I yeah. actually think it becomes character driven. I mean, I think early on it is about characters reacting to a situation, which is fair enough because a situation has arisen and they have to all have a reason to come together in the first place. Mm. But by the end of the film, they all they each find a reason to stay together. So, I mean, the the death of Coulson is seen as that turning point. You know, the, the, I'm using I, I'm, I'm using inverted commas when I say death of Coulson. Um, spoilers. Spoilers for, <laughs> you know, for... Well, that's why it's in very common. Spoilers for another universe. Yeah. <laughs> well, might as well be. But the that scene is kind of the turning point, but that kind of wakes everyone up. And, mm. and you've got S.H.I.E.L.D. as this kind of corrupting influence throughout as well. And by the end of the film, every single one of them have made the decision to tell S.H.I.E.L.D. to bugger off. Mm. Because, you know, they don't believe in... They don't think that Fury or S.H.I.E.L.D. are any better than the... Um, you know that than Loki or or his army, so they make their own decision to to sort it out. Um, yeah, it's a bit plot driven. I don't think Loki's that much of a trickster in any of the films, anyway. Mm. I mean, he is a little bit here and there, but like they call him, you know, they they call him a trickster. It's it's almost like when they call Ronan Ronan the Accuser when he doesn't <laughs> accuse anyone of anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, how um, ma how many times has Loki made you think he's dead and he's appeared back somewhere else at the that's end? Come on, true. that's a pretty neat yeah, trick. Well, that's, that's pretty, pretty tricky. Yeah. But what you expect is him to, you know, him to be able to manipulate people into doing what he wants by making them think that they are doing what they want. And he doesn't really do much of that. Hmm. Um, and it's interesting in this film that what he's supposed to do gets turned around on him when Black Widow... Um, tricks him into thinking that she's vulnerable because of what he's saying and in fact it's just it's just her you know manipulating him into giving up information that he has so that that was a nice reversal of that and there's a couple of reversals of stuff like that in this film 
maybe he's not set up as a trickster before that, but it's just interesting to see Black Widow use that against him, and that kind of shows how good she is as well. I think he's, yeah, film Loki's just kind of like a pantomime villain more than... Because, <laughs> like, yeah, you can, you know, he's, oh, he pretends to be dead, but he's back. That's like, you know, it's Blofeld in James Bond or The Master in Doctor Who, or it's just the, the popular one, really. Whereas, like, and then I've not read too many, like, stories of Loki in, but it'd be fun, like, I'm thinking more of, you know, in Age of Ultron when Scarlet Witch gets into people's heads. And, yeah. like, like, that sort of stuff, but, like, a whole film of this, like, is any of the film we're watching, like, is it something Loki's spinning on us, or is it actually what's happening, that sort of thing. I was, that'd be quite fun to have with him before he's, before Tom Hiddleston gets bored. <laughs> <laughs> Gets bored and wants to appear in King Kong sequels. Yeah, when he's sick of getting handed <laughs> briefcases of money. Kong, this time it's serious. <laughs> oh, it would be fun if all other Tom Hiddleston films are Loki films. And it's all part of a very big plot. It's like, I've been living in this high rise and, I'm, and I've got King Kong and I'm, I'm, I've been not having making my money as a night manager and now I'm going to come and get the Avengers <laughs> it's like 10 years of his actual career is all just Loki and it's all just one big trick and Crimson if that Peak happens just then I will yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Crimson, I'm not saying Crimson Peak yet but yeah put all of his all the Tom Hiddleston films together and make that turn out to be one big plot and then I'll forgive the Avengers <laughs> that's my final offer uh, Kevin final Feige offer. that's <laughs> And we all know that Kevin Feige is listening to find out what we think, and he's going to change accordingly. Yeah. And if you are listening, then we, we're happy to sign up for the, the Marvel money, please. I'd love to. <laughs> I'll, I'll wear as many solo shirts as you like if you, if you, if you give me money. Or anything by Disney. What else are they making? Frozen 2. <laughs> uh, Mary else? Poppins Returns. Yeah, Mary Poppins Returns. All of them. Oh, yeah, if. If you're listening, Kevin, I will sign on the dotted line immediately. I mean, everyone thinks I'm being paid off by Marvel to like their films anyway. I might as well be. <laughs> yeah, we're not being paid by them to like their films. We're being paid by them to hate DC. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is a huge <laughs> difference. Um, yeah, I, I guess like it's hard for me to get away from how much I like this film and to think about how that the story drives the action or the actions of the characters um more than a, more than I'd initially thought it's one of those it's one of those movie magic things isn't it you just trick the audience by yeah maybe this doesn't make a whole ton of sense but are you enjoying it yes fine and then <laughs> you know it's one of those um it's it's to encourage you to think about something else while you could be thinking about this and and this film does that a lot where it just it delivers a lot of stuff and maybe it does have a bit of a slow start um, with it, with a car chase underground and things like that, I'm just like, yeah, don't really know who these people are. Samuel L. Jackson's been in like two scenes of stuff before this. Um, Hawkeye, we've seen him once. Maria Hill, this is the first time we've seen her. Why should I care about any of these people? And then you get to the point where you start introducing Black Widow, and then the Hulk, and then mm. uh, Captain America, and so on. You know, it's. I think uh, the the way it introduces people is meaningful. And I talked about this in the Justice League podcast where. In Justice League, whenever you meet all the characters, it tells you nothing more than you need to know about them in order to keep the plot moving. Whereas with this, it gives you a bit more insight into who they are when you do meet them. At least for the most part. I don't think you find out a ton about Black Widow other than she's a spy and she's in the middle of some situation. Um, I wanted to say something about Maria Hill in particular. Um while I like the film generally, I found her character very bland. And somehow, like, I didn't believe that she had the authority that we are told she has. Like, at some point when she starts barking orders, and I'm like, I don't feel like we should be listening to you. Like, I just, just don't... Like, shut up, Robin. Yeah, yeah, just like, I just didn't believe <laughs> that she was second in command. And I don't think that she believed it. You know, like, she delivered the, the commands with just... This this kind of half half hearted tone, like you know, that I don't know. Like I just never believed that she was who we are told she is. 
Um, and I suppose I, I didn't really warm up to her until uh, Winter Soldier. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's when you kind of get the proper impression that she is the second in command. Yeah. Really, but up until that point, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. It's like she doesn't appear to be a Fury's personal assistant, but seems to be somewhere close in middle management, doesn't it? <laughs> she. Yeah, but when we watched um, Jessica Jones, I was like Hogarth. I was like, oh, she'd be good as Maria Hill. And Craig was like, we've already got a Maria Hill. I was like, I can't. Which, like, who is it? I think she. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Like, yeah, she's just sort of... She's the other Hydra member with lines, really, for a bit. Like, she's not as, like, you know, imposing as, like, Nick Fury or, Mm -hmm. like, a big sort of leadership character. Yeah. I I suppose. I I didn't give her much thought in the the first Avengers film other than, okay, she's here. And I hadn't watched How I Met Your Mother by that point, so the significance of her being there was kind of lost on me. The fact that people were excited about her presence. I was like, don't know who she is. Fine. Uh, you know, the, the actress. But I watched How I Met Your Mother afterwards and and then it does come, become a bit, <laughs> shut up, Robin, you know, after that. But um, she's she is much better in Winter Soldier and then again in Age of Ultron. Mm-hmm. And she's in a couple of episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as well, uh, where she does a good job. So... Um, Maybe the character's not necessary for the Avengers, especially when you've got Coulson, and everyone loves Coulson. He's all of us. He's that guy that's there. He's loving it. He's enjoying just being being part of the team. Just happy to be invited. I know <laughs> the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always, I always liked Coulson, right when you see him in the first Iron Man film. And he's only missing from one of the Phase 1 films, actually. You know, Captain America, for some reason he doesn't appear in that. But... Um, he is really good, and they did a couple of shorts with him as well, where he was quite endearing. So, I think as the kind of human, uh, in a very common human aspect, looking in, he was really good because he's the. Will you sign my trading cards, Captain America? And he's just like he's just fanboying <laughs> all over the place. Something I really like about uh, the relationship between the characters, and I suppose it does fall within the umbrella of you know ego match within the first hour. Um, but the idea of Tony Stark meeting Captain America and the complicated stuff that comes with this is the guy that my dad helped make and my dad is dead and here he is and I just want my dad thanks um, sort of thing, which Tony has a lot going on of. Um, and it's just like really interesting to see them like finally meeting and what that that meeting is like and the fact that their egos do clash because they both want to be in charge uh, and one of them technically is and the other one is in principle because he's just so good. <laughs> he's just such a nice man um, and everyone just wants to listen to him. Like whenever they're both like kind of giving orders and, and Tony Stark just like turns around and looks at him like who's in charge here sort of thing. I love it. I think it's great. Yeah, the the ego um, ego trip is definitely a big part of it, and you've got this. Um, it, they shouldn't be in the same room together, at least at the beginning, because there are too many egos on display. You know, you've got Banner who's standing off in the background, just trying not to get involved, because if he gets involved, things will get giant and green. Uh, but you've got Stark who, you know, wants to be the center of attention. You've got Steve who's he just wants to get the job done, and he thinks that Stark is in the mid, uh, in the way of that. And you've got Thor, who's just stumbling around, kind of, I don't know, kind of primitively, I suppose, because he's just he's just there to just drag Loki back to Asgard, and he doesn't care about employing any finesse whatsoever. So you've got these this real clash of personalities, which is just great. And I think that the film uses that as an excuse to establish the relative power levels as well. So you've got this, you know, Th- Thor and uh, Thor and Iron Man are fighting because they don't like each other, but this also tells you how powerful Iron Man is versus Thor so you know Thor is up there but Iron Man can hold his own with damage and then Captain America turns up and his shield can block this hammer that we already know can break anything so it gives you the kind of idea of what you're dealing with power wise and that's very smart storytelling I think to put it comparatively like I don't know if are you any of you like wrestling people but it's like if like get that scene where they fight in the forest but it's kind of like if you're like, because I used to, my old flatmate was into wrestling, and you go, and like, everyone's going wild. It's like, oh, the Undertaker's finally going to fight John Cena. And I'm like, 
okay. And it's like, yeah, they are. You know, this. She's like, oh, look, this is the power levels, and like, this is how they're like, all the moves and stuff. And I'm like, yep, yeah, okay. That's like, I don't, I don't know what the word power levels were to begin with, and everyone seems fine at the end. So yeah, like that bit. Well, it yeah. So yeah, people who understand, like, oh, it's Iron Man, and that's the, you know, the beyond there, and only those worthy are able to like withstand it. And and but then yeah, if you're coming in as just somebody who's just watching, just three actors, just sort of whack props. You're like, okay, that's, this this last to you know this bit will go, and then they have to be friends. So yeah, when you're not like invested in like the the characters and like you know the uh, the expectations of them like oh what's it going to be like when Captain America finally meets Iron Man like if everyone else just like oh yeah the two characters are just sort of uh. mm. yeah that's where the kind of fan service element comes in where yeah. you know Joss Whedon is clearly um, clearly a big fan of all this stuff and he wanted to cram as much in this film as he could and that enthusiasm shows so it's like it's that co- it's a classic comic book question. Everybody wants to know who's stronger out of this guy versus this guy. And then, you know, what would happen if Iron Man and Thor fought? Who would win? It's like, well, nobody would because Captain America would stop them before it got to, out of hand. And that's exactly what happens here. You know, he just shows up and he's like, right, guys, stop it. And then after that, they kind of get on task a little bit. A little bit. Uh, so in terms of the, the character dynamics, so what you've got is um, they almost pair them off slightly. I mean, everybody gets their moment with Coulson, pretty much. But you've got the uh, the Stark and Banner bromance because they're both science guys, and uh, Stark finally meets someone who's smart as smart, if not smarter than he is. Mm. And uh, and that's kind of it, instead of being resistant to that, it's something he really likes. They get along really well, and I love that um, Stark keeps taunting him into becoming the Hulk throughout. It just like zaps him and, and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> It's the bit, the bit where it's like, so what, how do you control it? Is was it a was melon? Was yeah. Yeah. Is, is it Pilates? Is yeah, it yeah? Like, like, what are you doing? What's your secret? Yeah, melon jazz, bongo drums, or a big bag of weed? You know, stuff like. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it doesn't get the answer, but um, yeah, the the Pilates thing is when he's making fun of Steve for being old. It's like, how do you you know how do you say <laughs> oh, Grandpa, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're pretty spry <laughs> for a seventy yeah. year old. <laughs> yeah, and and that's just Stark's nature. He just gets under everyone's skin. Yeah. Except Black Widow, actually, because there's a couple of moments in the film where she's kind of impressed by his antics. It's when he overrides the PA system, she kind of yeah. smirks a little bit. And the bit where he says that he's genius playboy billionaire philanthropist, he, she just kind of mm-hmm. she just kind of goes, yeah, that's yeah. what he is. <laughs> so she's secretly <laughs> impressed by him, and it's interesting that they've not really done much with that. Yeah, it's I like, guess so. But but I think I think they've always been kind of friendly. I think that's the idea behind this. Yeah. I think Steve got in the way, you know, during Civil War, the two become a lot closer, don't they? <laughs> Not Civil War, during uh, Winter Soldier, sorry. Winter Soldier, yeah. yeah. Uh, the two of them a lot family. But, um, yeah, I mean, you quickly glance over what I think is one of the funniest lines in the film, uh, that one, and it's been memed off of so many times. Uh, the billionaire playboy philanthropist line and all the other bits. Uh, Cap, with his uh, references... Different things that he's he's day to day, you know, little little lines that people give that he doesn't quite get, which I, I think neatly That's, done. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, um, I think Cap's quite interesting as well because um, I can't remember where I, where I saw this, but it's it's talking about how so this is the first film where Cap has been unfrozen, so he's. Well, he gets immediately drawn into a situation that's quite massive, so he doesn't really have much time to adjust to his new surroundings. But you've got the whole idea, you've got a guy who's suffering with loss, you know, he's lost everything that he ever knew. You know, in in the original comics, he was only frozen for like 20 years, so everyone he knew was just a bit older, but kind of still alive. And weirdly, there's more time has passed in real time in the comics than since he got frozen. But the, so the, the time gap for him is quite significant, and um, the way I think the way I've been encouraged to think about Steve throughout the rest of the films is there's never a point where he isn't sad about something. So he's always, you know, he's always contemplating what he's lost and, and he's trying to find a place in the world and he's always trying to find something to do. So, like, the, the Avengers seems good for him because it's, I can do this. I can, you know, I can throw my shield at stuff and help out, but he still doesn't have a place. And on the team, he doesn't really have a place because he doesn't understand what anyone else is talking about. Hmm. Yeah, so, I completely agree. It's, it's an interesting way to look at him. He's, you know, he's always just a bit sad, just a bit morbid. Not emo, mm-hmm. but morbid. So you're saying Captain America needs a hug? 
She does. She does need a hug. Yes, Steve. <laughs> Steve. I went. Well, I was watching the uh, Infinity War trailer recently, and just like that, that one moment where like bearded Steve is like grappling Thanos's just like one hand, and he's struggling. I'm like, no, Steve, somebody help him. I just, I can't. <laughs> Um, there's, there's one thing that I forgot to say. I, there's this really interesting link, um, between the scenes in which we are introduced to all the Avengers. Um, so somebody has a line that introduces the next scene somehow. Um, yeah, like the big guy. You should have left it in the ocean. Exactly. I love those. The one yeah. war is won by soldiers, and just like like all of those, all of those little moments. That's it's it's one of my favorite things about this movie that it's actually really well constructed in places, and it really shows it in in these moments in particular. I I really I really like it. And Joss Whedon says that's accidental. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Sure it was. Yeah. <laughs> sure it was. I believe you, Joss. Yeah. <laughs> Thousands wouldn't, but I believe you. Yeah, that, 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 it's a good way of kind of doing it because it kind of, it's almost like checking off a list of now it's time to get to this guy and this guy and this guy. And like, and you've got the connecting tissue, obviously, of S.H.I.E.L.D. and um, and I think, uh, I think Banner's introduction is the most interesting one because you're almost meeting this guy for the first time as well. Because, mm. well, because I mean, you've seen the Edward Norton version, but the Mark Ruffalo version is nothing alike. They are not the same character at all. So you you know you're getting this kind of impression of I, I guess it's someone that he's accepted what he is, but still kind of afraid of it. And so you know, I love the the line about the the Tesseract, and he's like, "What does Fury want me to do? Swallow it?" Yeah, <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> that I that's actually like to see. <laughs> that's actually such a sad moment for him. I think. Um, and and he he grapples with this a lot in the film, you know, the idea that they just want him for the Hulk, and the insistence of Stark that no, we want you for your brain, but then it really turns out really they do want him for the Hulk, um, and just that's that's his kind of like the, the, like the cross he bears, you know, throughout is I I am me, I am not this other guy. Uh, he's constantly at war with his other self, and the idea that they don't want him for who he is and what he can offer is quite hurtful. Although initially they do genuinely seem to want him for, you know, his ability to to find the cube, because that is their only objective at that point. And I don't think that Shield want the Hulk running about because, at the end of the day, Fury's objective is to make sure the alien invasion doesn't happen. Hmm. Well, I suppose he doesn't know about it at that point until Thor tells him about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thor turns up and drops some exposition. Yeah, and kind of onto Thor as well. It's his. I mean, his interaction with the other characters is really interesting because you've got this whole. He thinks he's a god and thinks he's above them a bit, and mm. uh, and so it's it's almost the learning humility lesson again, where he, he has to see these people as as worthy, and it is definitely the. The scepter that's doing the, you know, manipulating them slightly, but he is kind of doing that. You're so petty and tiny, and he thinks that he's better. Where mm. He's just where he's just not. I mean, the first thing he does is just trash the place when he shows up and forcibly remove Loki. He doesn't try and talk to anybody. He just comes right rushing in, grabbing people and flying off. It does kind of remove some of the good work that was done through his own introduction film. You know, through the four film, when he comes in and, like you say, kind of trashes the place and acts a bit. A bit disrespectful to the locals, uh, yeah. for want of a, a better phrase. You know, it does kind of undo some of that. You know, thankfully, most of it's sort of restored in the end. There's a bit of a sort of openness there at the end, but at first you're a bit put off by it, I think. Well, there's a there's an excellent moment uh, for Thor, I think. It's just after he's been kicked off the helicarrier and he's, you know, it takes him a few seconds to realise that um, he can't just hit the the glass to get out of it because you know not that smart he's kind of dumb but uh, <laughs> yes i mean yeah um it's the moment where he's he's in that meadow and he sees the the hammer and he kind of mm-hmm. hesitates before picking it up yeah almost as if he thinks he's not worthy of it anymore and mm. um and it's the way it's shot it's almost like the hammer's looking at him judging him which is yes which is like such a nice moment you know it's yeah just little things like that and 
again, Joss Whedon's uh, enthusiasm for the material just shines through there mm. in, in moments like that. I do love that moment as well. Um, and I maintain that the Mjolnir kind of feels sentient in a way. Um, you know, like it has a personality throughout, like most of the films. Um, I th- I think that there is like a sort of a sort of to and fro somehow, even though it's an object. Like I don't know, it's it's a bit it's a bit strange. Uh, but I guess I guess we'll never know. Um, <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's no dead spoiler. Yeah, for, yeah. For another spoiler point. for Thor Ragnarok, but there's no more Miamia. <laughs> Well, we don't know what's going to happen in Infinity War. Maybe he'll get a new one. Oh, maybe. The soul of the original will be transferred to the... You know, <laughs> to the... But yeah, it does have some kind of gauge of worthiness, doesn't it? So it's, it's constantly challenging its user to be worthy of it. So um, so there's that. I mean, you've got... They don't really do much with the worthy aspect of it in the first Avengers film because there, there isn't time. I mean, the closest is when the Hulk tries to lift it and he can't. And, uh, you know, I love seeing that because... It's just it's just good fun seeing the you know people try to lift Mjolnir because nobody can except almost Steve except Steve for a little bit yes <laughs> and Vision of course but you know they never explain why that is because hmm. they don't know I suppose so the the film sets out to be I mean it's a summer blockbuster and it's one of my favourite summer blockbusters of the last twenty years we'll say you know it's up there with like Jurassic Park is out for me in terms of modern classics and. Uh, you know, and Pacific Rim, which is also a modern classic as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Hell uh, yeah. <laughs> listen to us talk about it for four hours if you don't believe it. So, yes. <laughs> uh, well, it and its sequel for four hours uh, in total. Um, and it definitely sets out delivering that. I mean, the I remember the action sequence at the end, Joss Whedon was talking about how he made it his mission to, to top uh, Transformers 3, which at the time was the biggest city-destroying chaos out there. Uh, but he also wanted it to have some meaning. So, you know, as in characters that you care about rather than a mess of different coloured robots that just get cut into pieces and definitely succeeds. That end action sequence, you know where everybody is, you know what everybody's doing and and you know what the stakes are. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I just... I I really approve of the way they bring everyone together. I think the team all bounce off each other well. I think the way it's set up does all right. I I agree partly with um, Isaac about the fact that they don't maybe introduce some characters for people afresh. They do assume some knowledge going into this, or at least it pays off more with some knowledge, I think, than it does going in as a blank slate. But I think it's one of the best films that they've done, really, um, because the struggle um, to include so many characters later on I think begins to hamper in some of the films which makes me worry slightly for Infinity War as much as it makes me happy to to have all these characters together finally I, I at the same time there's that little bit of hesitation in my head yeah it's, it's one of those I mean I remember when Age of Ultron was coming out I was thinking how are they going to pull this off there's just so many people in this bloody film and well, I mean, we'll get on to Age of Ultron, but you know, I like Age of Ultron. And in this one, you've got less characters, and it is a it is a mission to get them all together and have something meaningful to do. But how lucky are they that the, you know there was a previous cast built in where um, where everybody just bounces off each other so well. Everyone has such natural chemistry. I mean, they could have they could have easily just had a situation where one person just drags it all down. And I actually feel like Edward Norton would have been that if he'd stuck around. Mm. You know, I feel like his personality would have been too big for that. Whereas everyone else seems content to just get on with it and and you know give the give give the other actors the floor when they really deserve it and things like that. So um, I wonder what it would have been like had Edward Norton shown up in this film. That's an interesting thought, actually. I d- I don't know. Mm, I really think that Norton was miscast. I didn't really like him as Banner. Uh, so when they cast Mark Ruffalo, I was like, yeah, there we go. That's Bruce Banner. I think um, Norton was fine for that film, but as I said, the two versions of Banner aren't the same. You know, they've completely rewritten him for this film, uh, which is fine because it works better. But, you know, the the dynamic they built up between all the actors is great. 
I really like the um, friendship that develops between Stark and Banner, the the so called science bros. Science bros. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That that was unexpected. I you know I didn't really necessarily expect them to you know become friends somehow, but it does make sense. Yeah. And I I think it's played really well. Like you say, the the dynamic between the actors is quite good. I mean, you get that with Black Widow and Hawkeye as well. Mm-hmm. You know, she's the one that kind of snaps them out of it towards the end and and gets everything back on track. And it's the first time they've met, as far as we see. Mm. So, yeah. They've well, you assume they must them. have met before. Well, yeah. Well, you know that they've, yeah, they've worked you know together a lot. But it's the first time you've seen them work yeah. together on screen. Yeah. Well, I mean, the same is true for the entire cast, to be fair. But, um, it's, I don't know. Uh, it's just this... They're the only characters with a pre-existing relationship, um, and and they bring that across. Whereas the rest of them are meeting for the first time. And um, I mean, I'll I'll talk to you know I could talk for hours about how great I think Chris Evans' casting is as uh, as Cap because I mean I thought he was a good Human Torch as well. Let's not forget that uh, he's the first of the rehabilitated Human Torch torches into the MCU. Uh, but I think his casting is great because. So many, there's so many lines that Cap has, you know, where in the comics he's been written as pretty horribly cheesy at a lot of points. Um, but the, I think Chris Evans managed to deliver them with enough sincerity. The one that always springs to mind is the bit where I think it's Hawkeye says, How are we going to do this? And he says, As a team. And if delivered any other way, it would have just been, Oh my God. But the way he delivers it, it's like, Yeah, that works. What's the story upstairs? The power surrounding the cube is impenetrable. Thor's right. we got to deal with these guys. How do we do this? As a team. I have unfinished business with Loki. Yeah? We'll get in line. Save it. Definitely. I, I, do, I do think it works overall. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I think that we are all blessed with Chris Evans, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I was really surprised... Uh, how well they made it work with him as like tiny skinny Steve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then obviously with the with the transformation into actual St- like Steve, um, like obviously from that point on is where the story truly begins. But um, within I think the Avengers cast, like he, I think he's so pure as like a person. He, he truly is Captain America if his Twitter feed is anything to go by. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he is he is the captain we deserve um, yeah. and the captain we need and the captain we have, um, at least for now. Um, so I'm, yeah, like, I think he's truly fantastic. Um, and I said fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, like, the whole Fantastic Four thing is in the past <laughs> also because um, I think... Cap suits him so much more, or rather, he suits Cap. Uh, he he really embodies Captain America. Yeah, and I always say that in Spider-Man: Homecoming, you've got the the PSAs that show how Cap could be if he was written terribly. Yes. Yeah, and, and obviously it's a deliberate joke, but it's like with less skilled writers, you could have had this. Yeah, a lot it, of life lessons being delivered. <laughs> yeah, him just standing there being this paragon of vir- virtue, giving like meaningless advice. But and you see it a bit in Winter Soldier, where his morals are tested, and he mm-hmm. doesn't he doesn't waver at any point. And even in this film, I mean, I think he does waver, and I think that that's why Winter Soldier is interesting and why it's good. Because in the first Captain America film, his morals don't waver. He starts a good guy, he ends a good guy. He he kills some Nazis in the middle. But overall, you know, he, he he doesn't waver. But in in Winter Soldier, he questions where his loyalty lies and whether you know he's been fighting for the good guys the whole time. Um, you know whether whether he can trust anybody. Um, and he's he's such an implicitly trusting person. I think I think he definitely wavers in Winter Soldier. I mean, you know, if if the ending of the film is anything to go by. Yeah, although his principles never change. What I mean is, he never thinks about. No, mm. I think I think I think Fury has a point here. He's always he always knows what the right thing is for him. You know, he's never he's never 
budging on that whatsoever. And, and even in this film, it's yeah. you know the bit where he says, um, "I'm not," you know, where Stark says, "I'm not marching at Fury's fife," and he's like, "Neither am I." Mm -hmm. uh, but but we do have a job to do. We've got an alien invasion, so like we'll just steal a jet and get on with it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's where you know the whole civil war thing comes in. Is is sort of you you're either one team or you're the other, and both point of views aren't necessarily wrong. Yeah. But I think it's a character that's been uh, written very well. Chris Evans has done a great job, and it's kind of impossible at this point to imagine anyone else playing him. I would struggle to come up with a name that would work as well, I think. Remember when it was almost John Krasinski? Well, there you go. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I, I would not know who to who else to cast in there, even if I was to look to the other people that they've managed to cast in the MCU, and they've done some pretty good casting in this. Yeah. I mean, they did get to the point now, or they have got to the point now where they can basically ask for whoever they want to appear as whatever they want in these things. But I think uh, Chris Evans has done a, a great job, and you know, I, I I don't think I don't I don't want him to die in the new films. But <laughs> we know we know in the real world that contracts do expire, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they keep him on. Yeah. Speaking of contracts expiring, there's always a there's a, there's always a rumor about this will be the last appearance of Tony Stark because if nobody wants Robert Downey Jr. to leave, um, and it's. I think that was another example of pitch perfect casting because they cast as close to the real life Tony Stark as you would ever get. <laughs> and at least, well, I mean, I don't think Robert Downey Jr. might not be a tech genius. I don't know, maybe he is. I have no idea. Never spoken to the guy. But um, certainly in terms of the life that he's lived and the things that he's been through and the, the life experience that he has, they, they cast him perfectly. And I remember at the time there was a, there was a bit of trepidation around it because he was just on his, you know, on his comeback tour and it wasn't clear whether he could be trusted to turn up for filming and stuff at that point but uh, Iron Man was definitely the, the rehabilitation of him um, for certainly a larger part of the audience than say Kiss Kiss Bang Bang would attract mm. but, what a, but what a return you know what a return and then just added on in the, in the other films I mean he's the, he's the character that you've seen the most of before going into Avengers Yeah. so there was a, ro a lot riding on his performance in this film. Yeah, and he's funny. Um, when you see pictures of him just outside of the films, you're not sure whether it's Robert Downey Jr. or Tony Stark. They've become interchangeable at this point. So it's it's such a great piece of casting. I don't know that he was um, Tony Stark before they cast him. I think that he has he has become the embodiment of Tony Stark um but but I don't know that he was this guy before the before the film came out before Iron Man it's when the, I mean I'm talking about it as a connection to the comic book character in the comics he's an alcoholic he struggles with his own personal demons and oh, right. you know Robert Downey Jr has been through a measure of that and even though they never directly did that story in the films there's mm. still that kind of unhinged quality to him especially in the earlier appearances I suppose so. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and and here he's just great. But I like that he's a bit of a rallying force for for the team. You know, he he gets involved for his own reasons, and he's always pretty selfish about it. But like his decision to fly off to New York to fight Loki is is his own. You know, it's, he's not doing it for selfish reasons, and and he's almost ready to sacrifice himself. Except you know, it's not going to actually happen because Iron Man three has already started filming as you're watching this film. You know. Hmm. when it's in the cinema so like uh so you know it's coming but um at the same time since it's joss whedon it's not out of line for him to kill a character hmm. you know even a beloved one because he does that all the damn time <laughs> although doesn't in either of these films to be fair isaac what are your general thoughts on casting you haven't said anything in a while um uh, i don't know i don't uh yeah, they're, all, they're all fine aren't they I like. I don't really know. I'm not very good at casting when it comes to casting people. Despite the fact like, that you're often talking about who should play different characters. Well, yeah, it's fun to say that Kelsey Grammer will be Doctor Doom, <laughs> but like, I don't like say I don't know. Oh, like when the cast thing is Iron Man, I'm not. I have no idea. I can't. I don't know what. Like what? Like I wasn't. You know, if it was internet buzz around it or anything. Like I wasn't anything I was looking into. So that's yeah, it's just a world I never read. 
like explored. So, uh, yeah, the final thing. And I've, yeah, I can't think of anything. They're all pretty good. Cool. Um, yep. I actually always thought Hemsworth was a weak link out of a lot of them. <gasps> what? Yeah. Um... What? <laughs> no. Do you know what my first thought was when I walked into the first Star Trek film? <laughs> and he's in it for like a hot minute before, yeah. spoiler alert, he dies, I guess. Um, I thought, man, like this guy has such a face. He looks like a hero. He just looks like, you know, I would follow you type dude. Like, oh, wow, who is he? And at the time, he hadn't really been in much. And then the next thing he does is Thor. And man, they got the casting right, I thought. Like, he d- he does have like that kind of heroic physique, like the posture, his face, you know, the clean cut, you know, the the strong jawline, the, you know, I don't know, I think so, I think so. I mean, I wasn't a fan of the first Thor film, and I wasn't terribly engaged by his character in it. I think he worked better here. <gasps> you hurt my heart, Craig. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to keep saying this because I'm not causing you pain. No. But, <laughs> but the thing is, uh, you don't really get a sense of. Chris Hemsworth Thor until Ragnarok because up until that point he isn't really playing his own version of that character whereas I guess they embrace the fact that he's actually really funny by, by the end of it you know the, in every other appearance people laugh at him he doesn't really make that many jokes uh, I, th- I, I think I, that's okay not well, everything needs to be a comedy I know I know but uh, it does work for this because the Avengers have someone to make fun of you know the uh, Stark calls him Point Break and uh, and all that stuff, and he just potters about, not knowing really what's going on. Uh, he's yeah, he's the big dumb muscle of the group, uh, other than when Hulk's on screen. Bigger no. dumb muscle. Yeah, I disagree. <laughs> I think I think he's a very nuanced performer, and in fact, I mean, I prefer the Thor of the first film to. Not not that he's bad in Ragnarok. I quite like him. There's an evolution to the character there, which is fine. Um, but my favorite thing about Thor is that he is, you know, the older brother who has been raised to rule. He is the hothead who chases battles even when they're not necessary. And and like his journey in the first Thor film to becoming like a more humble and like thoughtful person over uh, a weekend i the, yeah i mean most most stories take place over a few days um most films in particular a lot of books too um and you know where one big experience changes your attitude it's possible it happens um and especially it happens in storytelling and that's okay it's okay to have like a, a short run but a meaningful one um and i think he definitely portrays that change quite well um yeah i i could wax lyrical about the first thor film and why it means so much to me but this is not the thor podcast and also i've already done that on the ragnarok podcast (laughs) so listeners if you want to hear me wax lyrical about the first thor film listen to the ragnarok podcast you Mm -hmm. will not be disappointed the Ragnarok trailer podcast, I think um, it was. You were on, wasn't it? Mm, I don't remember. I think I, I don't remember which one. One of them. <laughs> I'll find it and put it in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, one yeah. of one of the many four podcasts. <laughs> it's on one of those ones. I think I think he has been allowed to show some of his comic chops, and they've obviously slowly learned and going. Oh, he's quite good at doing this, and he's quite mm. good at doing a bit of this, and you know, yeah, he's used as a setup to a lot of gags, really. Uh, in the initial films, but he does show a little bit of it through there, and I think just you know pairing him up with a director that's so well known for the sort of comic timing and stuff just really brung it out in Ragnarok. Whether that's what people uh, wanted to see in a four film or not, but I you know I, I loved it. Judging by the box office and almost unanimous positive reception, yeah. it seems that people wanted it. I know I certainly did. I didn't realise I wanted it until I saw it, though. Yes. That's the thing. It's one of those that if, if you had it described to you going, well, uh, film number one will be this, film number two will be that, <laughs> but film number three uh, <laughs> will be a rip roaring comedy. Uh, enjoy. It's, yeah. you know, I, I don't think you would go into the first film going, oh, hang on, this, is, this isn't what I'm expecting from a film that's going to turn out like this. 
Mm. Imagine if you watched them in reverse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, yeah I, th- I think that that would be <laughs> that would be interesting. Um. <laughs> the Thor films are definitely divisive among even M- MCU fans. You know, they're yes. the ones that that people can take or leave. But I think the third one is the one. Oh man, they finally got it around to what everyone enjoys, mm. or as close to everyone as you can get. And it's and Hemsworth's contract might be up soon, so we might not get another one. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that's a shame. Mm. But at least I think with Cap, they were getting it right pretty pretty quickly, pretty early on. I mean, I have issues with the the first film and the fact that. I don't think that anyone should ever be given the pro forma of you have to give us an origin story, the entirety of the Second World War, and have them frozen, <laughs> and you've got two hours. Go, yeah. you know. And the fact is, how do we do this? We have three montages. Um, we, you know, we spend a bit of time on the origin story. We have a montage. We have another montage. Then we have another montage, and then we finish. Um, yeah. And um, you know, there's a lot of people that dig into you know his decision to to go into the ice when there was clearly other options and all that stuff but uh, all in all solid film and then Winter Soldier even better and then Civil War with hindsight not as good as Winter Soldier yes still great though but like not as good yeah absolutely um, I recently rewatched Civil War because I'd only ever really seen it when it first came out um, and I, I really wanted to kind of like have a refresher and yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think it's like the, the, the dinky little cousin of Winter Soldier, you know, it like wants to be, you know, that serious gritty movie. And yet yeah, it's, it's packed with a lot more kind of moments where you go, huh? And that just doesn't really land very well, I think, overall. Um, it's still a fun time, of course. But it's no, it's no Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier was truly like a political thriller with superheroes in it, um, and that and that was what really sold it for me. And then Winter uh, in Civil War, it's like, oh look, it's Spider Man and it's Black Panther, and they're all fighting and tearing yeah, up the airport in a parking lot for some reason. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. with a villain with a very convenient plan that just happens to all work. <laughs> like, a, like, a lot of, like a lot of villain plans that would never work without convenience you know well, uh-huh. like Loki's plan in this one yeah 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 <laughs> exactly there is there's a lot of uh, that's the only thing about some of these films you're like well, how did this villain's plan even happen it just they coincidentally need to have fights and arguments and things in order for all this not to work well the, this uh, film you know. was was one in a long list of villain wants to get captured plans you know, and, and Skyfall was out the same year, same thing happened. Yeah. You know, the Dark Knight was a couple of years before, same thing happened. Yeah. It's that thing where the villain, he wants to get captured and the bad and the good guys don't realise why. And usually when they do realise why, it's like, yeah, he could have done that without getting captured, probably. But it's it's just one of those things. Again, I'm having so much fun with it that I don't really mind. Um, so I already kind of touched on action, but there's... I mean, for me, there's a lot of moments in this film that are just, you know, they're, they're just crowd pleasers. And, and the list I've got here is, um, you know, uh, Loki getting ragdolled by the Hulk, which is <laughs> which just everyone seems to love, including me. Uh, the bit where Hulk punches Thor after they, you know, they crash through Grand Central Station. Mm. And, and of course, that really awesome crowd pleasing Hulk transformation um, where he just punches out the, the big Leviathan creature. I, I quite like the sort of little one shot they do between jumping between all the different characters during the fight, all your different heroes during the fight. Yeah. Uh, Josh you know, single takes. Oh, <laughs> I bet, I bet it works and it gets you the sense of everything that's going on. And yeah. yeah, I think it's just very well done that. Yeah, you start off with Black Widow, move to Iron Man, move to Cap, move to Hawkeye, and then end on Hulk and uh, Thor. Yeah, it's just. And the the camera just follows the action and it always picks a focus point. So, you know, Hawkeye's arrow takes you to the next part and so on. It's great, yeah. Uh, Age of Ultron opens with a similar sequence. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't like that it comes so soon in Age of Ultron because it, it's just, you know, I, I like the feeling of, you know, having earned that moment rather than, well, here we go, here's your interconnected single shot of everybody punching bad guys, enjoy. <laughs> you know, well, it's it's fe- like I think it feels... Satis- yeah. It's, yeah. Age of Ultron, you've had an entire film to set that up, and then... And then I mean, yes, 
Yes, but it's just not as satisfying to me personally. I'm not saying it's a bad shot or you know that it's that it's less you know good as a moment. It's just coming at the forefront of the film, there's a lot less kind of like it doesn't feel as a payoff. It's more like fan service in a way. Yeah, and obviously they're big on fan service in this franchise. It's kind of part of what how they got so far. But the uh, another moment I love is when Steve tells Hulk to smash. That's the only order he gives him. Guys, call it, Captain. All right, listen up. Until we can close that portal, our priority is containment. Barton, I want you on that roof. Eyes on everything. Call out patterns and strays. Stark, you got the perimeter. Anything gets more than three blocks out, you turn it back or you turn it to ash. Can you give me a lift? Right. Better clench up, Legolas. Thor, you gotta try and bottleneck that portal. Slow him down. You got the lightning. Light the bastards up. You and me, we stay here on the ground. We keep the fighting here. And Hulk. <sighs> smash. Obviously, it's the, the phrase that everyone will have heard of and... It's interesting to just turn it round again. Mm. It's the same way that Black Widow turns Loki's manipulation on himself. You know, she, uh, Steve tells Hulk to smash, because that's what he's going to do anyway. <laughs> like, I do like the Marvel movies, but I thought that Hulk's transformation is the worst part of Avengers. Because that was a bit where he was the character that I liked, and there's all the things you were saying about like how they wanted... He was like, you don't want me for... You know, you don't want me for you know mm. being Bruce Banner. You want me to be the Hulk. He's always to be this big weapon, and it's like he's always referring to him as the other guy, and it's like sort of a hidden shame thing. But then when he's like, I know I can do another. I was thinking, oh, like all that build, all that sort of his character build up, and that sort of like I'm not seeing the Hulk used as like a Jekyll and Hyde side character, and then at the end of it, it's like, oh no, it's just he can just convene. It's, it's fine. It's like I'll just turn to the Hulk. Like I'm always, I'm always up. I'm always ready to just. You know, go big and green and punch everybody. And I'm just like, oh no. Oh, no. Sort of, the one bit I was really getting into, I was really enjoying this, like, the, the sense of lack of control. It's like, oh, he's, you know, he, you've always referred to him as the other guy, sort of, the, you know, you, you lose control in the heli carrier. But it's like, oh no, wait, no, it's fine, don't worry about it. I can just hulk out whenever, whenever needed. So I was like, the last final sort of, ah, oh, fine, I guess. See, I see that as a very sad moment, actually. Like, less, like, sad for him, you know? Like, he's he's always angry. Like, he has that moment in his introductory scene in Calcutta when um, Black Widow corners him in that little hut. And, you know, she says, you know, we'll give you anything you want, or something like that. And he says, oh, yeah, because I always get what I want. And in that moment, he... Um, but th- there's a like, like a little baby crib and like he slowly rocks the crib back and forth and it's like well you know like he would have wanted to have a family and like live a quiet life but instead he's stuck with this and of course he's always angry and so in the moment where he's like actually cap this is my secret i'm always angry i always carry this um and that's how i i hold him back because we're always there together angry um like that that just like I, I feel sad in that moment rather than like, oh well, you know, here he is punching things. Like like he has to live with this. That sucks. That's not great. There was a round of applause at that moment where mm. I, I saw it in the cinema the first time. Because it is that just it's sort of the culmination of everything that you're in the cinema to see at that point. You know, this is the first point where the team are all together. They're all focused on one goal and You've been building to it for the last two hours, and it's just, yeah, it's just awesome. Hmm. But yeah, the, I see the sort of sadness aspect of it, and they do try to do a bit of that in um, in Ragnarok, where he's just like, "No, you don't understand. I'm hmm. like, I'm gone if I turn into the Hulk again." And, and he's like, "Yeah, you don't care about me." You know, they play it as a joke, hmm. but it is actually hmm. a really serious thing. To, yeah, to be actually. About. I mean, the the only bit that kind of throws me out is the the you know the first time that we see him transform, he's unstoppable, uncontrollable, destroys everything in his wake. There's no sort of control mechanism there. Whereas this final one, it's like, oh, he's in control and he knows what he's supposed to do, and he's taking orders and he's standing down when he needs to, and you know. See, I've, I've thought a lot about that, and my head suggests that the 
the first transformation it's like unplanned and yeah it's not by choice yeah yeah he's completely confused and just lashing out everything um whereas the second one it's premeditated he has a mission you know it's it it happens in the incredible hulk as well where he transforms into the hulk and then suddenly then immediately starts fighting the abomination and then even just helps people as he's going all oh, right it's people that he knows but the the idea is like if there is some measure of surrendering on Bruce's part when when he becomes the Hulk, then the Hulk can be, well, the, the Hulk's goals can be, um, you know, can be what's the, what's the word? <laughs> uh, the Hulk's goals match his in in that moment because he understands why he's transforming. It's all head cannon, and I'll I'm go. I'll go. Trying to I'll go with. Writing, but, I'll you know. go with your head cannon because <laughs> head, head cannon's fine. It's only if you're sit, sitting there and you're trying to pick through things like folk do that you kind of go. Um, well, what about? But like you say, head cannon. Okay, he wasn't expecting it, and the next time he's all prepared and he's ready to go. And I suppose that that kind of follows what they do in the other films, and Ragnarok explains it in its own sort of way. Yeah. That it does. It'll be interesting to see where he ends up in the the latest instalment. Yeah. And what do we think of the ending? You know, after the Battle of New York's over and everyone's like become Avengers fanboys, there's someone skateboarding as Captain America, Stan mm-hmm. Lee's like superheroes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, I really like that because it gives you that kind of. It's what's missing in a lot of superhero films, perversely, as in the the heroes actually being heroes. You know, you rarely see the kind of they've set an example for people people are looking up to them but at the, the end of the avengers it gives you that it gives you everybody reacting to what's happened and and the, the people on the ground are just grateful that there was people there fighting for them i mean yeah like wouldn't you yeah. <laughs> if we I had a massive that, alien you know. invasion you know yeah. like well good thing you guys were here <laughs> <laughs> We really, we're really lucky. We had those seven people <laughs> helping us out. Hey, one of them, better one than one nobody. Had, one of them had a gun. One of them had a frisbee. I think yeah. there was a bow and arrow involved. It was, it was, all, it was all a good time. A frisbee, <laughs> vibranium frisbees. Well, it is basically a frisbee. I guess you know. so. Oh man, <laughs> that's that's so much less cool now. <laughs> <laughs> like actually as an aside um the way that he uses his shield as a as a frisbee that's also kind of a boomerang yeah. um not a big fan of that i have to say um y- you know the, the the idea that if you throw a round object somehow it will return exactly to you like it's preposterous well it's like spider-man says this thing does not obey the laws of physics yes <laughs> But it's yeah. what happens in the comics, so I'm glad when you see it bouncing off stuff and then coming back to him. And it's like his his command of geometry is yeah. amazing because he can immediately do the calculations in his head. It's almost like in a video game where time slows down and you see the little <laughs> arrows showing where it bounces off to come mm. back. You know, like hits off these villains, little waypoints that he makes in his head. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't mind that at all. Um, again, that's a bit of fan service in the comic. Though, <laughs> you know, that's why he has the shield because mm. it does that and he can do that. But yeah, the, it's weird that the heroism part of it is, you know, is there because, well, it's not weird. I mean, it's weird that it's not there in other films, in other superhero films. Yeah, I guess so. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take a break here. The discussion is far too long to be contained within a single entry, so it has been split into more manageable chunks. Part 2 is available directly below Part 1 if you're listening on the website, or will be right after this one on whatever app you're using. A very special thanks to YouTuber Dagma for the supplied music, and we hope you'll join us in Part 2 for more Marvel Madness.